worship team. I was talking to one of them today just as I was grabbing a coffee, and I said, so when did you guys get here? And they got here at like 8 o'clock this morning to practice. And then I said, oh, is that you just getting your practice in and your warm-up all done on Sunday morning? They said, no, we are here on Thursday night too. So, I mean, our worship teams do a phenomenal job. So maybe we should just give them a hand. Yeah. Um, this morning we're going we're gonna to turn our attention to the prophecy of Ezekiel. And uh, a, a few months ago now, I think it was, um, we, were having a fam- we were having a family chat, and uh, Sam said to me, she's like, Dad, you haven't preached on the Old Testament for a long time. And I'm like, okay, well, I better get to the Old Testament then. So we finished uh, Ephesians, and this is a couple months ago. I started just thinking about Ezekiel, started thinking about the prophecy in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is actually like a really, really long book. So if we were going to go from chapter 1 right to the end of the prophecy, we'd probably be still there in a couple of years. So... We're not going to do that. Well, we'd probably get it done in a year, but we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 33. But I am going to flash back to some of the previous chapters to give you some highlights as to what we missed. And you might want to just, you know, make it a, a goal, maybe before Christmas time, to have read through the whole uh, prophecy of Ezekiel. Um, because that will definitely, I think, help you get more out of, out of this next uh, sermon series. And we'll probably have a few messages, too, of course, as we get closer to the Christmas season. We thank the uh, worship team. We should also thank the decorating team, because they have done a phenomenal job in uh, putting together our decorations for Christmas. So we're very thankful for them as well. Um, <clears throat> so we'll probably have a few messages around Christmas, I'm sure, as well. So, but, but Ezekiel actually has some pretty neat stuff to say about Christmas, too. You know, Christmas is, is really a, a fulfillment of prophecy. That's what it is. It's like God fulfilling prophecies that he gave all through the Old Testament about how there would be the one who was coming, and that one is the Messiah. Is the sound okay back there? It's going good? Yep. Yep, good. Okay, so I just want to give you a little highlight of who this Ezekiel guy is, okay? Ezekiel was born in a priestly family, and he was destined to be a priest. Now, to be a priest in those times was kind of like one of the highest things you could be, right? Like, you know, I don't know what it is in Canada, like a professional hockey player or a, um, I don't know, something, what, what do girls all long to be, dentists or doctors or I don't know. But anyway, uh, veterinarians, I think, is one of the things they usually love to do. Anyway, the highest calling, whatever, the, 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 the thing that, that parents, when their, their children are born, they have dreams of what they might become, a priest was definitely very, very high on the list, right? And, and, and a priest and a prophet are not the same thing, right? So Ezekiel became a prophet, but he was born and destined to be a priest. A priest was definitely a lot more prestigious and appreciated and honored and respected kind of position in the community. A prophet, on the other hand, was somebody who usually had a message for the people, and it usually was a message that they really didn't want to hear, so they found the prophet often to be this annoying guy who always had nothing but bad news to give, and quite often they would put a fair bit of uh, trouble in his way to get him to basically shut up, right? So, you know, prophet over here, priest over here, right? Everybody loved the priest. You go to the temple and you meet with the priest and the priest gives you God's blessing and everybody feels special after they've seen the priest and everything like that. So Ezekiel was destined to be a priest. But just 11 years um, before, but just before he turned 30, you, to be a priest you had to turn 30. So you're, you're kind of being, you know, molded in shape to become a priest. And then, but just before he was about to become a priest... Because just before he turned 30, he was taken into captivity with, uh, because the the Babylonians, you see the Babylonians, that's that's modern day Iraq, right? They came and God brought them because God's judgment was on the people. And so God brought the Babylonians to Israel and hauled a whole bunch of them, thousands of them, off into exile. They actually did this in like three waves. The first wave happened in 605. B.C. And in 605 B.C., a very um, well-known young man was part of that, you know, that first, that first deportation. And that, that young man's name is Daniel. So Daniel and some of them were, were in, taken in the first wave off into Babylon from Israel. And then in 597 B.C., the second um, deportation of exiles from Israel were taken. And that was part of what Ezekiel was in. 
So Ezekiel had some contemporaries, some other prophets that were uh, doing their prophetic work as well during Ezekiel's time. A guy who was much older than him was Jeremiah, and a guy who was probably younger than him, well, would have been younger than him, um, being Daniel, right? And so these guys are, are the contemporaries, which is, which is kind of interesting. One of the things that, you know, young guys do when they are looking at what different people do and what kind of different professions they're in is, is they look at different men, maybe, and they, they admire them, and they think, you know, that's kind of what I'd like to do in my life. And I can remember, you know, when I was younger and in Bible college, and, and, and I would see some guys get up there and, and, and preach God's word before God's people, and I always thought, you know, that is maybe what God's calling me to do, because I, I could really see that, and I, could, I, I, I had appreciation and admiration for what they were doing. Now, if I had been born back in those long, long years ago, and I was looking at the life of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I probably would have said, no, no, that's, that's not for me, because these guys had a hard, hard road. So that's, that's part of their ministry as well. So in 597 BC, Ezekiel it misses out on his opportunity to be a priest, and he's taken off into exile um, into, into Babylon, which is, like I said, modern-day Iraq. And then years later, in 586 BC, the temple in Jerusalem was completely destroyed, and that's when um, Israel was completely taken over by the Babylonians. The exile from Israel to Babylon was complete in 586 BC. Um, Ezekiel is a very visual prophet. Um, he had some wild visions. He had some visions uh, we read in, you know, for instance, Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, the glory of the Lord, and these wheels, and these angels, and these eyes, and these hands, and everything. He had some wild visions, but he was also a very um, uh, visual learner. So he would, he would uh, use a lot of visuals to teach the people. And, you know, today we, we look at pastors and we, we see some pastors who are trying to make their messages more um, understandable or more memorable. And so they'll bring a lot of visual aids into their, into their ministries. Um, and sometimes this goes really, really extreme. Like I, I've heard of like, like pastors who will like start running around throwing money. I'm not going to do that, by the way. But throwing money at, at the people. I've heard of like riding bikes through the sanctuary. I've, I've heard of like, you know, like all kinds of different ideas to just really grab people's attention and hold their attention and, and give them that visual aid to hang on to. Well, that's all good. And, and Ezekiel was somebody who used visuals. But do you know why he used visuals? He used visuals because the people would not listen to the spoken word. They wouldn't listen to the spoken word. So he did things. God told him to do things like lay on his side for months and months and months on one side and then lay on the other side for months and told him to, when his wife passed away, um, she died tragically. And what does a husband do when his wife passes away, right? Mourns, grieves, right? And, 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 Israel, and Ezekiel wasn't permitted to, to grieve. So, so he was going around like, like everything's fine, you know, and it wasn't fine. So he was using a lot of visuals. Now, while it's true that, that visuals are, are, are good at times, I just want to say this, that, that the Bible still says in Romans 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you are somebody who constantly needs visuals to hold your attention, and otherwise you won't listen, that's a sign that you're struggling like the Israelites were back then to just listen to the spoken word. And I want to just say I'm impressed with this congregation because they keep coming back week after week. And you probably noticed that other than me moving my hands around a bit, like I'm not doing a whole lot of visuals here. Um, and you keep listening. So that's a good thing because as it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Um, when the prophet, though, came, when Ezekiel would come and he would say, you know, and this was the thing that prophets would say. They would say, thus saith the Lord. And then it was like, okay, you really need to listen up now because thus saith the Lord. And it got to the place in Israel where when the prophet would come and he would say, thus saith the Lord, the people would like roll their eyes and they'd be like, oh, yeah, like thus saith the Lord, big deal, you know. They just got completely uh, uninterested in the words of the Lord. Um, so that's why Ezekiel begins to use his visuals and his images. Um, and so... Um, so Ezekiel, uh, as, we, as we look at this book, we can, we, can, uh, we can divide this particular chapter that we're going to look at today, Ezekiel chapter 33, into three parts. 
And the first part is this image of the watchman, verses 1 to 9, and then we have the exhortation to turn from evil in verses 10 to, tw- in verses 10 to 20, and then we have Jerusalem's fall and Israel's failure to heed um, in verses 21 to 33. Before we start really digging into the word, though, let's just take a moment to pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the prophecy of Ezekiel, and I'm sure that many of us have tried to read through this book before, and maybe even felt like we weren't getting a whole lot out of it. I pray that this time as we go through it, you would just open our minds and help us to hear what you want us to hear. Help us to be more than hearers of your word, Lord, but also doers. Um, we pray that, uh, that this, this, this book would really speak to us in a way that it never has before. And, and as we look at these several chapters in Ezekiel over the next few weeks and so forth, I, I pray that you would just your word would just go forth powerfully. Um, that we'd really see that you know, God is sovereign, and he is over his people, and, and he does things, and, and just how the prophecy, too, reveals the character of God in so, such a clear way. I pray that we'd really be able to hang on to those truths, and they would encourage us in our daily lives. And so, Lord, just speak through me at this time, your messenger. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll just start by reading uh, Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 to 9. If you have your Bibles. I'm going to be reading from the NIV version today. Um, I go from the NIV to the NASB. I, I love the NASB because it's, it's, it's a literal word-for-word translation. But the, the, sort of the negative of it is it reads quite woodenly, and it's hard when you're covering a lot of scripture to use the NAS, you know, B. So I love the NIV also, and I love lots of the English translations, and I like to kind of use different ones because it just gives the message that we're not locked into one English translation. We, we recognize that we've been blessed with many good translations, so... We're back to the NIV today. So verse 30, uh, chapter 33, starting at verse 1, says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword against the land, and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet... But did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would, have, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and take, takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. So the concept here is actually pretty simple, right? In those days, the cities were protected by a wall. So when you think about it, this big wall, who knows how high it might be, 15 feet or something like that, and it surrounds the city, right? It's, it's, it's the protection for the city. So imagine yourself in a city like that. You're, you're wandering around in the city, and you can see inside the city and what's going on in the city, but you can't see out of the city because the wall is blocking your view, right? So when you're in the city, you are kind of, Um, you're exposed in a way because you can't see what's coming outside of the wall. So what they would do is along the fence, they would put these little towers that the watchman would stand in and, and, and he would be able to see outside of the walls and he would be able to see if there is any danger coming. And in this particular passage, the, the danger of the enemy is referred to as the sword, the sword coming. And if we notice too, that when it, it, it said there in, in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 33, uh, verse 2, it said, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against the land. So who's bringing this enemy? Who's bringing the sword? Well, God is, right? And we might not be comfortable with that, but that's what it says. You know, we were just singing a song here in our worship service about Jesus and come, Lord Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. And it's it's a really pleasant song, and, it's, and it really causes us to really think about what a wonderful day it will be when Jesus comes and when we finally see him in all of his glory, right? But do you realize that when Jesus does come, it will be the beginning of 
the tribulation? That there will be great judgment coming on those who are not ready for Jesus when he comes? So when we're singing, come Lord Jesus, come, we're, we're, we're singing about, hopefully as a church, we will be ready when he comes. Because if we're not ready when he comes, when he comes, it won't be a great day. It will be a day of judgment. And see, so, so God, through Ezekiel, is using this analogy of how the watchman would stand guard and watch for the enemy to come. But it's just interesting how God identifies himself as the one who permits the enemy to come. And the reason the enemy is coming is because the people have been rebelling against God. They've been getting so consumed in their own lives and they've been ignoring God and they've been worshiping false gods and they've been doing things that God has told them not to do. And so judgment is coming. And it was the watchman's job to sound the horn and let the people know that judgment is coming. Now, how many of us, imagine yourself lying in your bed under your warm blankets and you're in one of those good states of sleep, right? Unfortunately, as we get older, we don't have as many of those states, but I, I can remember when I was younger, you know, you're just totally dead to the world. Your, your bed is just the best place in the world to be. It is comfortable. It is warm. You are, you are just in basically total peace. And all of a sudden, you hear that annoying, irritating, eh, 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 right? That sound, that alarm goes off. Who likes that sound? Nobody, right? So... When the watchman would start blowing his horn, how do you think the people would react to that? Oh, good. The horn is going off, waking me up out of my sleep and causing me to, take, to, to stand at attention and prepare for something. I don't want to do that. I want to stay sleeping. Now, imagine if uh, the, the, the watchman blows his horn and the people do. They get all ready. They get all up. They, oh, the danger is coming. Danger is coming. Then they look out at the, from the wall and they see the enemy coming, but they're like, that enemy isn't very strong. That isn't much of an enemy. I mean, our walls are strong. They're, they're fortified. We can deal with that in the morning. Why did you wake us up, watchman? Why did you blow the horn? Like, think about that for a second. Why would the watchman ever not blow his horn? Well, there's a few options. Uh, one is that the watchman is lazy and he falls asleep himself. It's the middle of the night and everybody else is sleeping, so why don't I catch some sleep as well? Because I was here the night before and the night before that, the night before that, the night before that, and nothing happened. So probably nothing's going to happen tonight either, so I'm just going to go to sleep myself. He might be just sleeping. But he might also be like, I see danger coming, but I'm not going to blow the horn because the people aren't going to appreciate the horn. Because the horn... Is the horn good news? No, the horn is bad news. Bad news is coming. And when we think about that, of course, we think about sharing the gospel with people, right? We think about sharing Jesus with people. And, and so often when we're about sharing Jesus with people, and I want to do this too, we don't want to tell them about the bad news. We just want to sort of talk them into heaven. If we can just convince them that this is just the best thing for them, if this is, this is what they need, this is, this is going to give their life purpose and more meaning, and, and God loves them so much, and, and we just focus on the good news, the good news, the good news, the good news. Right? We want to talk them into heaven. We don't want to blow the horn. Blowing the horn is saying, prepare for danger. Get ready. You need a Savior. Jesus is coming soon. But you need to be ready. If you're not ready, you're going to be left behind. That's what the horn is about. And you know, it's not just with the gospel. It's, 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 it's everything in life. You know, we need to be people who are willing to tell people when they're in a bad place. Not to make their life worse or to make it more difficult for them or to, to put them in, a, in even more of a, a, a state of discouragement or whatever, but, but to, 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 to warn them. Because I believe that this image for Ezekiel of the watchman is, is for sure an image that all pastors and other ministers of the gospel should take on. Like, we, there is definitely an example of being a poor watchman if you are a, a pastor standing in the pulpit week after week after week and you never tell people the bad news. You never blow the horn. That's a bad pastor. But I think you could take it further. I think you could say that you're not necessarily a great friend or a great neighbor, or a great uh, co-worker. If, and I'm not saying we have to go and just wave our finger at people and tell them this and tell them that, but like, 
at times we should sound the horn, right? We, we, we have to be watchmen. This is what, this is what God gives his, his prophet a picture of, is what he was called to do. And I believe in a way God calls all of his people to be watchmen for this world, to be people who are, are, are telling them. Because it says in, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says that for just as man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. So think about that. When a person dies, the moment that they die, they're going to face judgment. That's what it says. Man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. So if we're going to face, no one wants to really face judgment. But if you're going to face judgment, and it says we all are going to face judgment, well, we want to be prepared for the judgment. And... The watchman's job is to sound the horn so that the people are ready for this judgment that's coming. You know what? If, you're, if, 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 if you've heard the horn and you've recognized that I am terribly and hopelessly lost in my sin and that I need a savior and that that savior is one and only Jesus, Jesus is the savior who came to save me from my sin, if you realize that and you put your faith in that, then you don't have to fear the judgment. But if you're somebody who's trusting in anything other than that, I'm, I'm sounding the horn. Because the Bible tells us that for those who, who fail in the judgment, like they're judged guilty, and if any of us are, have the, the, um, the confidence or the, the audacity to, to stand in our own good works before the God that brings judgment... We are told that we are going to be sentenced to eternal wrath. That the wrath of God will be poured out on all of the sin in the whole world. And the reason that those who believe in Jesus will be able to avoid that is because the wrath of God was already poured out on sin in Jesus when he died on the cross. So, yeah, when he, when he died on the cross, he, he took the wrath of God on himself. For us. So if he took the wrath of God for us, then we can be confident that when we face the judgment, we can be confident not just in the fact that God loves us, but we can be confident also in the fact that God is just. Because a just God will not punish sin twice. Sin only needs to be punished once. So praise the Lord for Jesus, right? Yeah. All right, so that's the picture of the watchman. But you know, the people aren't very happy with this, and they've got their own thoughts about it, and, and we find that here in verse 10. It says, Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Therefore, son of man, Say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not, be brought, will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but they then turn away from their sin and do what is just and right, if they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees they give life, and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right. They will surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just. But it is their way that is not just. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, they will die for it. And if a wicked person turns away from their wickedness and does what is just and right, they will live by doing so. Yet you Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. But I will judge each of you according to your own ways. And one of the things we need to remember when we're reading the Old Testament is that the gospel is not come to full fruition yet. Like, 
the whole picture of the gospel has not been completely revealed yet. So God, through the Israelites, is, is developing the whole picture of the gospel one step at a time. And at this time, they're under the law. And the law was set in place so that they would realize that no one is righteous. Because that's what the Bible says, right? The Bible, here, here God is saying, if you're righteous, you will live. If you're evil, you will die. And he's saying, you know what else? If you're somebody who has, you got off to a good start, you were born, and, and you lived a good life, and, and, and everybody in the community saw you as a very respectable person who did a lot of good things for charity and other actions that were out there that, that you got involved in, and, and, and everybody thinks about you and thinks, man, that guy's a great person. But then all of a sudden, you kind of lose your way for a while. And you kind of go off track and you start to embrace things that are evil and you start to do things that are embarrassing and the community is like, man, I don't know what happened to that person. They were such a good guy, but now they've really wandered away. Um, God says, that person will die. And the Israelites are saying, wait a second here, that's not fair. Like this person put in like 20, 30, 40 years maybe of, of good living. Like shouldn't that count for something? Can't we bank our righteousness, if you will? And then once our righteousness is banked up, can't we get away with a few days, a few weeks, months, years of, of kind of going off track and kind of embracing whatever the world has to offer? Like, can't I, like, bank my righteousness up so that I can do a few bad things and, you know, sort of the, 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 the righteousness that I've already banked up will, will cause me to be good at the end? And, and do people with today think like this too? You know what's interesting is that, is that this was written, like, over 2,000, 2,000 and, oh, I don't know, like 500 years ago, roughly. And, um, but people are people, right? Like, these people lived a long, 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 long time ago, but they still think just like you and me. They still get it in their head that if I do enough good things, it should be good enough to outweigh my bad things. And when they find out that, no, that's, that's not good enough, they say, that's not fair. That's not fair. Like a fair God would recognize that I've done more good things than I have bad things, so I'm good. And God says, no, no, that's not good. Because you don't need to be, might have, have some good things banked up. Your bad things are still going to condemn you. And people say, that's not fair. But what are we really doing when we say God's not fair? What are we doing? We are determining that we know better than God. We are saying, I know what's fair. And if God says that this is what he's going to do, and I, in my judgment, determine that that's not fair, then that's not fair. Because I know better than God. Right? And God is saying, no, no, no. In, uh, in, uh, in Isaiah... Chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, we read this. It says, for my thoughts, this is God talking to his people, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. If you ever, like I have so many times, struggle with thinking, that's not fair, or Whatever it might be. You have some questions. You, you're, you're, you're determining that if I was God, I would do it this way. You, you need to come back to this verse here in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And realize that because his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. And then his ways are so much higher than our ways. We should be totally expecting that there are going to be times where I think it's not fair, or I think I would do it differently than God did here, or why did he permit that? I would never permit that if I was God. It's normal to think like that. Because, after all, your thoughts are not his thoughts, and your ways are way lower than his ways. But that's where the whole thing about faith comes in, and it comes in about trusting that God does know better than we know. And, and, and God wants to reason with these people a little bit. So he does, because sometimes, especially when I don't think I was.
preaching that long yet. <laughs> I killed the battery. Hey. Sometimes when, when we especially look at the Old Testament, there's this, there's this idea that goes around that, you know, the God of the Old Testament. Have you ever heard that? The God of the Old Testament, he was harsh and he was, he was, he was um, condemning and he was so, you know, stubborn and, 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 and unforgiving. And then all of a sudden, we slip into the New Testament and it's like Jesus finally comes on the scene. Ha! Ah, we got now this God of love and mercy and grace and, and everything, right? Have you ever heard that before? I've heard that before. But you know what, if you look at the Old Testament, one of the things God wants to say to the people, we see it in verse, um, verse 11. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather they turn from their ways and live. This is the God of the Old Testament speaking here. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Did you know that the people of Israel, before this judgment came on them, they were rebellious against God for, you know how long? They were rebellious and unfaithful toward God for 400 years. For 400 years, they would make little images out of wood and worship these false gods. For 400 years, they were doing things that God commanded them not to do. They were breaking all of the Ten Commandments and so on and so forth. And God just permitted that and permitted that. And perm now, let me ask you. If, if somebody was unfaithful to you, and if somebody didn't keep their promises with you, and if somebody treated you harshly, and somebody didn't respect you, and somebody took advantage of you, how long would you put up with that person? How long would it take before you'd say, I'm done with them? I don't know how long it would take me, but it wouldn't take me, you know, 400 years, right? Like, God permitted this for 400 years. Because God doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. But instead, he desires that they would turn. And that's why he says, you know, even the person who's born and they live a very wicked life, and then as they go through life, if they get to a place in their life where they're like, I don't want this life for me anymore. I'm turning from this life. I want to live a life of righteousness. Then that person, it says, will live. And again, this isn't the whole picture of the gospel yet. This is just getting to the place of what we call repentance. Where you recognize, I don't want to be in that life anymore. Then God says, you know what? You can live a life of like total disobedience to God for quite a long time. And if you turn, because God is so desiring not to bring judgment on the wicked, he desperately does not want to bring judgment on the wicked, that if you are, as we all were at one time, part of the wicked, that if you come to a place in your life where you finally get it, and you're like, I am turning from that life, then it says that person will live. Okay, so let's uh, read the last part of this chapter now. Verses 21 to the end of the chapter. It says, in the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has fallen. So we've reached that, that time of the complete destruction of Israel, the uh, 586 B.C. date here. Um, the city has fallen. Now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer silent. There was a time, again, this was a tough calling that um, Ezekiel had, where, you know, God just put the mute button on Ezekiel. He said, you know what? You're not going to be able to talk anymore. You're just going to have to do everything that you have to do visually. And then there will come a moment where I'm going to turn the mute button off, and you're, you're going to be able to speak again. And this was the time where he was able to speak again. Verse 23, then the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. Son of man, by the way, is just like Ezekiel's nickname that God has given him. This isn't like the same son of man that we, we think of when we think of Jesus. Um, that was a special name that God had given Ezekiel. Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. See, again, here's where the people are trying to reason and think their ways are, make more sense than God's ways. 
um, they, we continue, it says, but we are many, surely the land has been given to us as our possession. They're basically making the, the, uh, they're, they're making the, the, the argument that Abraham was just one guy, and God gave him the land, which in reality he didn't. I mean, he promised him the land, but, but Abraham never totally took the land. We don't see the God, we don't see Abraham's people taking the land until Joshua comes over the Jordan, and then they begin to take the land. Um, but their point is, is that Abraham was promised the land, or he had the land in their mind, and he's just one man, which is one man's righteousness. And their reasoning is, well, there's a lot of us. Think of all the righteousness that all of us have done in our life, all the good things that all of us as people have done in our life. Surely that's far, far more than just one man could do. Right? That's their argument here. Therefore, say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, so now God is basically putting them in their place. He's saying, mm, your righteousness and all this stuff that you talk about, how good you are, well, let's just actually look at your track record here. Um, since you eat the meat with the blood still in it, they were commanded not to do that, but they did anyway. And you look on idols, worshiping, again, I mentioned these little false gods that they worship, these little pieces of wood that they crafted into something that looked like a bird or an animal or a person. Um, and you shed blood, murdering. Should you then possess the land? See, the land was a gift to them that God had now, because of their, their sin over 400 years, had taken away. Um, it says, verse 26, you rely on your sword. So you don't rely on God. You rely on your own might. You do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Oh, so now you're having sexual immorality is rampant there. Um, should you then possess the land? Verse 27, say this to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. As surely as I live, those who are left in the ruins will fall by the sword. Those out in the country I will give to the wild animals to be devoured. And those in strongholds and caves will die of a plague. So no one's going to be able to escape this judgment that's coming. Verse 28, I will make the land a desolate waste, and her proud strength will come to an end, and the mountains of Israel will become desolate so that no one will cross them. Then they will know that I am the Lord, when I have made the land a desolate waste because of all the detestable things they have done. So their land is going to become a desolate waste. And we're going we're to see more of that be unpacked as we go through um, Ezekiel. But at this point, God is saying there's going to come a time in Israel where Israel is just a desolate wasteland. And it was for many, many centuries a desolate wasteland. Verse 30, as for you, son of man, your people are talking together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come and hear the message that has come from the Lord. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. You have to realize that back in those days, they didn't have iPhones, they didn't have TVs, they didn't have iPads, they didn't have any of these great things that we have today. So for entertainment, you know what they did for entertainment, believe it or not? They would go down to hear the prophet. <laughs> like, let's go down and see what the word of the Lord is today. Let's, uh, and they found it actually quite entertaining to, to hear the word of the Lord. Let's hear the word of the Lord. It, 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 it tickled their ears, I guess. It was, it was something that they would kind of go back and they would talk about and they'd say, did you hear what he was saying this, this week? Or Like, that's really interesting, but yeah, whatever, right? This is how they would talk. And then they would go back the next week and they'd be like, oh, yeah, well, that was very interesting. But the thing was is that what, what, what God is saying here is he's saying, they, they like listening to you, but they never do what you say. And I just think this is a, a challenge for us because I think we all, I know I do, we like going to church. We like hearing God's word proclaimed, but we don't want to get in the habit where we just get so comfortable with this habit that we're in of going to church and hearing God's word proclaimed and we just sort of think of it as it's just part of my week, and I actually find it quite interesting, and I learn something, and that's all great. But more important than just learning something and just being able to add another piece to your, your list of knowledge is to do, right? Like, we're supposed to hear something, and then we're supposed to do it. So when it talks about, you know, how we're the watchmen again, 
we go, wow, that's a really interesting story. You know, we got this guy standing on a wall, and he's seeing the enemy coming, and he's supposed to sound the horn, and he's supposed to tell people that judgment is coming, get ready for judgment. And we hear that, and we're like, well, that was very interesting today. It was an interesting story about the watchman. But then we don't do anything. We don't recognize that God puts an incredible amount of responsibility on us. Because he says, if the person hears the horn, because the horn is sounded, and they do nothing about it, well, then that person dies, and the blood is on their own head. But he says, if, if, if the horn doesn't sound, then the person is still going to die for their sin, but the blood's going to be on the watchman because the watchman didn't sound the horn. Like, that's, that is a huge amount of responsibility. And Ezekiel is a faithful watchman. He's sounding the horn, but the people have gotten so comfortable with this that they actually find it entertaining. They actually kind of think of it as like we would go to a concert, you know. He says it's like a, it's like a love song they're listening to when they, when they hear this. And, and, but they have no intention. It's just like going to a concert. You, you go to a concert not to leave there thinking, now I've got to do something. You go to a concert and you go, well, that was very entertaining. That was pleasant to my ears. I enjoyed listening to all that music. Now I'm done with that piece of entertainment and I'll carry on with the rest of my week. But when we're hearing the word of the Lord, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to hear the word and then do the word. And that's where the challenge comes. So, verse 32. Indeed to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. Verse 33, when all these come true, and it surely will. And this is interesting too about prophets in the Old Testament. You know, you want to be really careful about identifying yourself as a prophet. Because in those times... It was great if you were a prophet, but you, you better be sure that you truly heard from the Lord. And that's why I'm not a prophet. I don't, I don't present myself as a prophet. I'm just trying to preach what God has already given us in his word. And I'm just trying to bring it to life for us that we might hear it and might do it. But in those times, they didn't have Bibles like we do today. They had prophets. And these prophets would bring the word of the Lord. They would start off with, thus saith the Lord. And when they said, thus saith the Lord... They were speaking on behalf of the Lord. And they would talk about what was going to come. And if they said, this is going to come, and it didn't come, the, the, God said, put that prophet to death because that prophet is a false prophet. So you, you wanted to be really, really sure that you were a prophet before you started presenting yourself as a prophet. Uh, so verse 33, when all this comes true, though, Ezekiel is a true prophet. It says, and it surely will. Because Ezekiel is a, a, a true prophet. He's speaking on behalf of a sovereign God. And when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. It says, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And so there's almost a, a bit of a, a sadness even in that last statement as we close the chapter. Because it's like you get the, you get the idea that, that they will know that a prophet has been among them. But the question is, did they listen to the prophet? Did they listen did they listen to the sovereign Lord speak through his prophet and tell them what they needed to hear? And the answer is, did they do what he said? Unfortunately, a lot of the people in Israel, they kept hearing these prophets, hearing these prophets. At times they found them entertaining, like we hear in Ezekiel we read. At other times they found them really irritating. And at other times they found them to be threatening, so they put them to death. And that's why when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, you guys have always killed the prophets. You guys have always ignored the prophets. And now the greatest prophet of all is amongst you, Jesus, who was the greatest prophet, and you don't listen to him either. And so, as we continue on through Ezekiel, I hope this will encourage us. I, I, I always want to think, I hope people, when they leave here, they leave more encouraged than when they came. And I think the thing that should really encourage you today is that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that the same God who waited and waited and waited for the Israelites to turn for like 400 years, like tells us how long-suffering God is with us. And he has been long-suffering with me, and I'm sure he's been long-suffering with you. But don't test him. Don't, don't say, well, he'll just keep being long-suffering, because he won't forever be long-suffering. We don't know how long he's going to wait. We don't know how long he's going to wait. We know that he doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. That is clear in the Old Testament. That is clear in the New Testament. But if we don't get on board with the Savior 
And that's Jesus. Amen? That's Jesus. Then when judgment comes, we're going to take all that on ourselves. And it isn't going to be pleasant. So that's my word for you today. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the fact that you are long-suffering. You've been long-suffering with each and every one of us. And I thank you that you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You made a way, the only way, for us to be saved from the coming judgment. And that Savior is Jesus. And we thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you that even in these, this next month, we're really going to focus in on, you know, the, the, the coming Messiah, on the one who is, is the Savior of the world, the Savior of the world. Lord, that makes no sense to us, though, if we haven't heard the horn, if we haven't understood that there is bad news, judgment's coming, and we need to make sure that we are safe in, in, in the arms of the Savior, Lord, that, that he, has, he has already taken the wrath of God on himself on the cross, and that he won the victory over sin and death through his resurrection. We thank you for that. We pray that every single person here today would know that, would, would put their faith in that and that alone, and that they would, um, they would know that they don't need to be afraid when the, when the Bible says things like, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Because when the judgment comes, we can stand there, not in our own righteousness, but we can stand there in the righteousness that has been freely given to us through Jesus. Lord, I, I do pray for our community too because I think there's a lot of people out in that community who um, haven't heard the horn yet. They haven't, or if they've heard the horn, they've, they've rolled their eyes and ignored it. Lord, I just pray that you'd be working in their lives, stirring in them, causing them to realize that they need to get ready because Jesus is coming soon. We pray this in your name.